Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of The View. Here it is April already, and the snow has melted in Minnesota. Hooray. Aisha House, are you awake? I am awake because I am on the East Coast, and it is 11 a.m. here. It's a reasonable hour. I'm at my aunt's store, um, my Santa Erica, who I adore, and I'm on Staten Island, so getting ready for <clears throat> a certain conference. Christina, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm coming to you from Charlottesville, Virginia, where it is finally, I think, starting to warm up. Um, into spring, and I'm excited to be getting in my car later on to come to um, a certain conference and uh, see some folks. And Reverend Michael Tino, where are you coming to us from? Good morning, everyone. This is Michael Tino coming to you from Peekskill, New York. I will wave down the Hudson River at you, Asia. Um, it's nice to have you uh, here on the East Coast. Um, Life is good here in the magic garden. The daffodils are blooming and chuckling at me. So uh, things are good. And it's so nice to see Jessica Star Rockers coming to us as uh, filling in on tech from, from the West Coast. We're sorry that you're still stuck out there on the West Coast, though the Pacific Northwest must be beautiful this time of year. Uh, how are things there? It's gorgeous today. I'm going nettle picking later, which is a total Northwest thing to do. And then I'm going to make soup from the nettles. So, you know, I'm enjoying the, the springtime in the Northwest. I am on Facebook, um, fielding your questions and comments. I'm on Twitter, hashtag The View. I'm excited that Keith is here today and we can hear the story of the search process this year. So welcome, Keith. Yeah, we're excited to have as our guest today, Reverend Keith Cron, the Transitions Director at the UUA. Keith, are you uh, heaving a sigh of relief that for the moment is it a lull or is it still going going fast? I know contracts right. are being worked on. Well, this yeah, we have, we have contract questions. Last Thursday was the initial offer day. More and more things are becoming public. Okay, uh, wait. Have... Before you go, we're going to just pause for one minute because if Aisha and Christina don't get to talk about this conference, <laughs> they will be very distracted as you begin to talk. So if you could yep. pause for a minute with all the news, let us just talk about this conference. Aisha and Christina, you've been really very vocal about your disappointment, so share. Where, where should we start? <laughs> so, um, I've attended Revolutionary Love Conference, which is a conference uh, put on by Middle Collegiate Church in New York. Um, the Reverend Jackie Lewis is the lead minister there, um, who's been really, really um, active in organizing scenes and um, fighting for liberation. And the conference um, has been going on for many, many years. Um, I've only been to it for the past three or four. Um, but it's it's a trend I think Isha and I have both noticed, at least from when I started to what I saw last year, is that it seems to be, um, in my opinion, moving away from kind of the liberation roots of where it started and is really getting to a point where it is um, catering to a, a white audience and making that white audience comfortable and making liberation um, and anti-racism more palatable to a white audience. Um, and that really came to a head this year with the um, invitation to Shane Claiborne um, to come and speak. And, and I'll let Aisha take it from there. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I, I went when it was still called the Leading Edge Conference and it was after Valerie Kors um, in, uh, being a part of it, although she's not a part of it this year, that it was renamed. So. It, it, it used to, my first couple of times going there was actually very um, raw. And one of the, here's, a, here's an example of a panel. Um, they had uh, two white police officers and two black women. And one of the women was related to the one of the Charleston Nine who was murdered. Um, and so it was, a, it was one of the most raw conversations. It was the four people on the, on the chancel. Just, it, it's still, I still think about it. And it was haunting and, and real. Um, and then the last couple of years, it's turned into kind of 
I mean, and there are some, um, Tracy Blackman, uh, Miguel de la Torre, has been amazing speakers, but they've gone away from, in my opinion, as Christina named, um, rooted in liberation. So Shane Claiborne's thing is living, he's a Christian, uh, living the way, as if Jesus meant what he said. And so, um, okay, great. And his thing now is this gun, this is anti-gun, which I don't think is a very controversial stance, but sure. He's, melt, he's so doing a book tour, he's melting, asking people to melt guns and make things, great. He, he, what his critici the criticism of him is he's never come out and taken um, and affirmed the fullness of the humanity of LGBTQ people. And he's kind of hedged it or just avoided it and been radio silent. Okay, then, then he could do that. Jackie can invite him and I could say, this is not, that means this conference is no longer what it used to be when I first came. And I can, I mean, this, I'm here already, I'm invested, I'm literally in, in, on the East Coast. Um, however, I could name that it's a problem when the Methodists did what they did, when the Unitarians, what happened with UU World, that I know someone who's simply saying, yeah, I'm going to be, you know, he's never said anything, actually. He's never said either way. And to me, that's a problem. And if, if folks in the LGBTQ community say he's causing harm in the way he's approaching progressive Christianity, I'm going to listen. So that's where I am with that. I don't care. People already are tweeted. Some, somebody's tweeting me. Well, let him speak. He's allowed to speak. Of course he is. He could say whatever he wants. And I'm allowed to say that means this conference is not something I'm going to be a part of anymore. That's it. He can do whatever he wants, but it's not a liberatory. It's not a conference rooted in liberation if we're starting to hedge our bets. So that that's. Yeah. And, and I think that's exactly it is that, you know, folks can, um, of course they can speak. It's when a conference that I'm going to for, for a very specific reason and um, framing itself as a very specific environment um, is giving a platform and resources to somebody who cannot affirm me in my fullness. And, and you know, the rest of our LGBTQ community, um, you know, he has gone, when he's taught, when he's been asked about um, what he terms anti-homosexuality, um, he has said, you know, it's a shame that, that Christians um, are, known, are known more for what they don't support as opposed to what they do support. And, you know, the, the wide encompassing of, of who we, we do support. And to me, that's just a backhanded way of saying, um, you know, I don't want to come out as being anti-LGBTQ. I want to be known for all the wonderful things that I do do. And this one thing that I don't agree with, um, you shouldn't hold it against me. And well, and from what I've seen, when he's really pushed, he's said things like, I believe that God wants us to be in opposite sex relationships and have children. Um, so, you know, he has to be really pushed there, but that's what he believes. Yeah, so he, it's not like said, it's some mystery. Yeah, he said that he believes that, that God should, um, that if we're following God's word, that, you know, we should have a mother and a father for every child. And um, yeah, it's just, you know, it's not... You want to have that conversation, have that conversation, but I'm not going to a conference um, put on by Middle Collegiate Church, which has done really wonderful work in, um, in liberation movement, but, and yet seems to think that it's okay to give time, platform, resource um, to this. I don't, I, I'm not, and, and when asked, when, when this is the other thing, when Middle Collegiate was asked, when Jackie has been, you know, she's, she knows that people are tweeting about this and Facebooking about it. And so an email came out to address this. And to me, that made it, it was even more egregious because the, the email that came out said, we are holding space to have courageous and daring conversations. And that, that's not what this is. We are not here to, to center and try and save one white dude in dreadlocks. Like that is not what my liberation is talking about. My liberation is centering voices from the margins and making it as uncomfortable as possible for people who are perpetrating white supremacy. Like that's where, what we need to be doing. We don't need to like change this one individual and, and pat ourselves on the back because maybe we brought him closer to our understanding of Christianity, that 
I, I don't have time for that, right? Like if we have to change every individual's mind, that's just, that's not what I'm here for. So. Um, and pay for the privilege. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it looks like a lot of people are writing on Facebook how much they appreciate the work that you're doing on this. And I know that I do. That thing where you're sitting and waiting through silence and waiting and waiting to waiting to see if you're part of humanity. I think we've all experienced it for different reasons and it is excruciating. And silence is its own voice very, very much. Meg, can so, I just name real quick that you use have supported this conference on mass for many years. And that's also why Christina and I are on fire about this. It's not, so somebody emailed me about Wild Goose. Wild Goose is a Christian, you use, I don't think on mass attend Wild Goose. That's their own thing. I have, and again, I'm not, he could talk wherever the hell he wants. This, and at one time U, UUA helped sponsor it. I don't think we are this year. I did email a few speakers, but that's also why you use on mass go to this. Yeah, it's, it's, it has been a, a great, I mean, I take my, my youth there. Um, you know, I, I at least take my own children, but I've taken other youth there as well, because it's really important for them to see from an interfaith perspective, other faith traditions doing the same work that we hold as central to Unitarian Universalism. And I don't want that couched in, in making white people comfortable. And if, you know, we, we do enough of that in Unitarian Universalism. I don't, I don't need to drag them, you know, hundreds of miles in order to experience that. So, um, can I, yeah. Can I say too, that I think it's really important that um, you, a Aisha and Christina, that you are speaking up about this because I think your attendance at Rev Love in the past has been something that has spoken to you use and sort of signed off on it a little bit as a place to experience that liberation and engage with that work. And so I think it's really important that you're saying this. So I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, I'll be curious to hear how it all unfolds. And thanks to social media, we'll, we'll get to watch. And thanks to all of you who wrote in. It looks like C.B. Beale went to uh, some school with this guy. I don't know which school it was, but anyway, said that very familiar with the idea that there's social justice and personal morality separate things <laughs> and that LGBTQ people fall in the latter category, not the former. Well, we've all seen that around race, haven't we? Uh, that separation of, oh, I treat everyone the same, you know, anyway. So let's talk to Keith Cron. Let's hear <laughs> what's up with the search. So why don't you start by just kind of filling us in and we'll just start by mass appreciation for the huge amount of work that you and all the congregational search committees and all of the folks who have been touring the country, speaking in massive numbers of congregations and all of the people who have served as references and just the huge effort of the whole movement that goes into this time of year. So start with appreciation for that. And here's the epicenter of it, Keith Crown. <laughs> so where are we now? Well, it's great to be with you all. Um, and uh, we actually had um, uh, some some pleasing results for me this search year. There were 45 congregations looking for full-time ministry in either senior or assistant positions. Uh, 39 of them found ministers. Um, only having six not find them, it ties for a low in my nine years in being the in, in the transitions office, which I feel really good about. Um, um, so we'll have six congregations that have to let me know, about, know by tomorrow whether they're going to enter into the second round. Uh, we have 10 congregations currently looking for developmental ministry, and we're turning toward interim ministry, which will gear up at the end of the month. So um, uh, I, I was pleased with, um, uh, in particular, how, how certain things played out. Uh, we had a brand new uh, ministry search system that we used for the first time in the settled ministry process, which uh, I think is um, really uh, been beneficial to ministers and congregations in search. Um, and, and one of the things we'll be looking to do is to figure out how to even make it even better for next year. And, and all of this will happen by the end of the month. So it's just a different kind of anxiety and a different kind of busy. 
That's great. So I know that not all the results are in and their contracts being negotiated. And so there are probably some things you can't say, but from again, social media, hot stove report, and just looking at people's feeds, it looks like some exciting historic um, pre-candidating is going on. Uh, the candidate, there is going to be some historic and exciting candidating weeks going on. And um, it, it really feels like um, um, one thing to know is that I've been doing beyond categorical thinking trainings, which is our anti-oppression training, all 24 years I've been at the UUA. And, and, and one of the things that I've noticed um, are some of the differences that have occurred over the years. And um, our congregations just tried harder this year than they did have in previous years. And I, you know, you see these little shifts, which, you know, indicate people are, are, are trying to move. And uh, given that we're dealing with such interesting age demographics and Unitarian Universalism, um, I have cautiously some hope for uh, the work that people are wanting to do. Talk about those interesting age demographics. What do you mean? Well, um, We've seen more people who are younger on search committees, but for the most part, most of our congregations have a lot of folks who are, who are older. Uh, one of the questions uh, that the congregations are constantly reeling with is, um, how do we have more people, particularly the 30 year old millionaires who can come in and support our congregations at the levels they've been used to, uh, which really isn't going to happen. Um, and, and how do we support, um, uh, you know, who we are and what do we need to do to adapt to a quickly changing world that we're all seeing. And, and I see some congregations trying. I saw more younger folks on search committee this year. It wasn't all retirees in most places, which has often been the case. More people of color um, um, and, and, and more openness in the search process. People actually um, uh, paying more attention to to, to what they need to do and seeing um, uh, the work is their issue and not the minister's issue. One of the things I told Asia um, last year, uh, toward the end of last year, that's true. It's like in the beyond categorical thinking, it used to be the greatest concern around calling a minister of color was there'll be a single issue minister, all they'll talk about are issues of race. Uh, this year, the overwhelming concern is we have more racism here than we think we do. What do we do about it? And, and I really credit the white supremacy teach-ins and all of the attention and work that has happened um, in our movement to help bring about that particular shift uh, in terms of how congregations are seeing themselves and the work that they need to do. And, and that's really exciting because, I mean, I, I feel like I'm not answering the same questions because um, that, that I was before and people are trying to engage in different kinds of ways, some better than others, and yet, um, I think we'll find at the end of this search process, there will be there there are some exciting matches that um, give me uh, some hope for our future. So the question was asked, what makes a candidate in week historical? I think what I was referencing, particularly, and of course, all the results aren't in, but there have been at least several trans and non-binary folks who are candidates. And I know we had trust on a few weeks ago, and they were talking about a lot of searches going on, but of course, and we've heard this from people of color for decades, it all comes down to the choice, but I've been excited to see some of the choices. Uh, are, you, are you seeing that, uh, Keith, in ways that are new? Yes, I am. My favorite story, I mean, the choices are exciting. People are, are um, uh, really trying to challenge themselves in ways, um, trying to figure out, you know, basic things about how we do, you know, we're talking about someone who's been in church for 30 years, um, really trying to figure out how do I approach this? How do I talk about this in my congregation? My favorite story this year was from a pre-candidating um, uh, congregation getting ready to meet one of our, our trans ministers. And, and the chair of the search committee told me, we spent our meeting before the pre-candidating weekend practicing pronouns so that we could get it right. I have never heard that in, 24 years of ministerial search. It's, it's, it's like that to me is, is, you know, a step in the right direction. That's not to say that all the work is done, but it's like, you know, thank you for really uh, trying to make this work. And, um, and, and while there's a lot I can't say at this point until things become public, 
Um, not only do we have trans ministers who'll be called, uh, some of them were, were multiple yeses in multiple congregations. And um, it, it, it just seems to be uh, like, like our denomination is, is, is really trying to, to do better around gender. And I mean, I, I, you know, and as someone who's been around for a while, as Meg and I look at each other in particular, who've been around for a while, that, that has taken a long time and on, on, on the shoulders of a lot of people who did work uh, for years before this to get us to this point. Let's just lift up always Sean and Barb. <laughs> back, <laughs> back when it was just, trust was Sean and Barb. I just, it's come a long, long way and it's very exciting to see. Very, very exciting. Um, what did you oh, see? Oh, go ahead, Michael. I, you know, I'm just wondering while we're on this this subject, um, and I, I, I wanted we can take a moment to celebrate, uh, <laughs> just purely celebrate uh, movement around gender and transgender and non-binary ministers. Um, wh what are you seeing around uh, ministers of color in search, Keith? Is there is there anything that you can say? Uh, um, compared to previous years or whatever? We, we are going to have um, one fairly spectacular announcement coming up for sure. Um, that, that's going to, you know, when all of this becomes public in some ways, maybe I should have been on in a couple of weeks, but <laughs> um, that, that I'm really excited about. Ministers of color experience, uh, for the most part, uh, good results in the search process. Um, on the other hand, we still had, I mean, here's a story where a search committee, this is, this is I think, is sort of emblematic of, of uh, so often the conversations I have, a conversation that said they were disappointed, they didn't have a minister of color, color on their list, and they actually did. <laughs> I mean, so I, 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 there is still a whole lot of work to do. On the other, on the other hand, um, our congregations, again, seem to want to be engaged um in in all of this uh work and realize that this is work that they have to do and and there's still a lot more of it that needs to be done i mean i i spend a lot of time um uh talking with folks in particular in second ministry searches you know one of the big red big red flags for me is when the senior minister says the white senior minister says i want a minister of color to come in and be the the second minister of the congregation and, 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 and that's one of the things that it's like, I understand why you want to do that. And I think it's problematic. And um, it, it's, it, you know, it's part of the educational process uh, that, that, that we're a part of and um, trying to help people understand that, you know, even when you're trying to do the right thing, it may not be the right thing to do for someone. Um, and, 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 you know, that sometimes that's hard and complicated, but I also think it's necessary. I, there's a reason why you have this job and I'm clearly not an ordained person because my first thought was they're not toys. Like, sorry, you, you don't get, no. Okay, <laughs> I actually have a practical question. Um, so someone had posted, and I don't remember who and it kind of doesn't matter, um, because is it true that most people when they go to a neutral pulpit don't get paid? That it, I mean, why wouldn't candidates get, I mean, it seems little, but it also seems super odd to me that someone's taking the time to go to a neutral pulpit usually flying there and they don't get just even, I mean, when I guess preach at pulpits, I get paid a couple, you know, a couple hundred dollars and why wouldn't people get paid? That's, that, that's an interesting question. I get the question maybe twice a year from colleagues or search committees or hosting congregations about whether we should, should pay. Um, the rule of thumb, and I'm more than willing to look at it is this is part of the job interview that, uh, you know, for, <laughs> Well, I mean, it's taking time. I mean, I, I, okay, yes, it's part of the job interview that is costly for everyone involved, but why wouldn't the, the, the host congregation, they're going to pay for whatever. I think it's absurd. Uh, you know, maybe you'll start a groundswell, Asia, because you often do. <laughs> that, that leads to a change in the rule. Um, um, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting question and, and certainly one I'd be open to exploring. Um, um, and, and taking a look at, um, um, cause, cause I, I agree with you. It's like people are doing work for a congregation. On the other hand, uh, 
you know, they are applying for a job. And what, what I wouldn't want to have happen, the one danger sign, which I'm sure we could figure out, is people accepting pre-candidates just to rack up another measly $250, which I actually think some people would do. I don't understand what you just said. I'm saying that if so, if I go to, let's say I'm candidating and I go to a neutral pulpit, why wouldn't I just get the 250 or 350 dollars that I would get if I wasn't pre-candidating? I'm not clear what you just said. What would I be racking up exactly? Well, I, I think there are people who would become a little more open into where they might pre-candidate because they knew they were going to be getting extra money, and they may not be. Jeez, we have a number of so ministers. Sad, who, that's not true. That's just so sad. I, 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 I've watched ministers over the years do what I refer to as vacation expeditions for pre-candidating oh. weekends where it's like, but I've always wanted to go and check this play out and I might want to go there. And, and, and you know, I, I think this would be a great question. <laughs> Aisha, I just love your poker face. It's just. <laughs> well, what, I, what, what comes up for me is that some congregations really see it as a favor that they're doing to open their pulpits that way. They don't see it as free labor at all. They see it as that's really going to mess up our flow of worship. And we already have a bunch of ministers, especially large churches that they, you know, they really act like it's sometimes an imposition, but they'll do it to support the movement. So um, because generally they pick the people who come in, right, that they pay. And so this is saying they're going to come. You don't pick them. You don't pick their topic. It might not fit in with your flow and then you pay them. So I, I actually... Oh. I think it's a, I think it's an I interesting mean, Meg, question. I, I serve a small congregation and it is an imposition and it is a favor. Um, and we do it anyway. I mean, we, 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 we do it as a favor to yep. our other congregations, knowing in part that when one day I leave, uh, our search committee will need that favor from other congregations. Um, and so, you know, my, my, you know, my suggestion, if if we're making suggestions, is is actually that search committees build that money into their search budget, um, because I think that what, yeah, I think ministers using pre-candidating as vacations is really kind of gross. Um, so I think we need to we need to change that culture if that's actually happening. But what I'm seeing is people who uh, rely on pulpit supply income or who are just finishing seminary um, who, who have to decide, um, you know, I have these paid gigs and I have to take an unpaid weekend for a job interview. Um, and I've been invited on four of them or five of them, but I can really only afford to go on three of them. Um, and so I, I'm seeing that side of it from, from people I, I deal with too. So and CBBL wants data. Yeah. <laughs> I think that anytime you're you're putting in policy to discourage, you know, particular actions of particular people, um, you know, they're, they're, that can lead to problematic policy um, because what you want to do is actually address those particular problematic people as opposed to addressing policy. And I think the policy factor is, you know whose labor is getting, um, is getting used and, and how. And so, you know, it's, it's not just the labor as, as many of us who preach know, it's not just the labor of the preaching day, it's the labor leading up to that, of setting up the, the, ser the service, um, writing the sermon, you know, doing all of those things um, and, and I absolutely agree that I don't think it should be the neutral pulpit who is paying um, for that, that uh, privilege <laughs> of, of having somebody come in. Because, you know, it, it, while you're excited to be the neutral pulpit, you're also like, oh, crud, you know, we got to kind of reshuffle a bunch of things. Um, but yeah, I think that the, the search committees that, that are already putting budgets together, you know, for the search process, that that should that should be part of it um, because that, what to some may seem as an insignificant amount of, of funds can make the difference between somebody else, you know, having food 
for their family for that that month. And um, I know a lot of folks who do the the pulpit supply business, and it's 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 their income, you know, it's how they live. So um, I think anything we can do to to try and equalize that would be really really helpful um, for for those candidates. Well, I think as you're saying, Christina, it's not just the income from the preaching. If you if you have a job where you have to take time off to be in search, it's going to be a very expensive um, job application process because it, you know, depending on. And I have heard people who can only afford to go to three places or something. So that's just a larger cultural thing that we kind of count on people to already be in place somewhere with money in order to be able to afford the way that search happens, I think, in the way the sermon is just a, a tiny bit of it. It's like our general assembly and other things that, that really rely on people with a steady income and, and don't think about people who have childcare and unpaid time off and all these other expenses. So Keith, um, what, what kind of contract ministers are people is, do you see trends shifting in that? And I mean, not contract, the um, developmental, where as I understand developmental, it's when congregations really say, we need to work on X. Do, do you see any shifting? Because I've always kind of heard them all over the place. But, but I wonder, as you say, congregations are getting kind of more serious about mission and, and living our faith and everything around um, oppression. Do you see any shifting in the kinds of things that developmental ministries are looking at? You know, um, spoken or unspoken. <laughs> I mean, that's that's part Either. of my question. Because I, I think a lot of congregations are feeling um, a generational pinch. And, um, and, and, and one of the things that I notice in terms of, of what I see congregations doing, it's like, we know we need to change. We know we need to bring in, I mean, one of the common things we hear is we need to revive our religious education program. We need to bring in more families. Um, and, but what they generally mean when they say that, I find if you dig deep enough is that we want to bring in more families who are exactly like us. I mean, where we don't have to look about changing our culture, um, about, about, about how we do things. And, 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 and so you see congregations thinking about that, um, uh, not necessarily explicitly, generally often in very broad terms, um, and my concern is that they're going to start looking at, at some of these real issues actually too late. Uh, one of the things I started saying and beyond categorical thinking this year, one of the questions you really need to wrestle with is, do you want a minister or do you want a hospice chaplain to come serve you? Because if you're not willing to change in this day and age, chances are you need a hospice chaplain because that's the way the world is trending. I mean, uh, we, we look at how quickly things are changing. And if you want to be the small group of folks who are, um, uh, retirees doing things the way that you've always done, those numbers are just going to dwindle. Um, and my favorite moment was when the entire congregation, when I said that, they all stopped and looked at each other and it was like, ooh, wait a minute. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 so what I see are congregations who are sort of going to the edge of the pond or the shore and seeing if they can put their toe in. Um, but uh, uh, most of the developmental congregations are, are really wrestling with, um, uh, you know, things like governmental structure. That's what they want to work on. Um, in many cases, we're looking at a history of ministerial misconduct because they're trying to figure out how to rebuild trust in the congregation. Um, um, often, we're looking at a congregation trying to figure out whether or not to stay in its building or not, or should they move to some place that is better located or cheaper or whatever the particular issue is. Um, so I had a question, um, Keith, you had said that uh, 45 congregations had been in search and about 39 had, had um, found their candidate. Um, what did the numbers look like on the other side? How many um, folks did we have who were in search? We had 79 ministers by the time the process was over, who had clicked on a congregation. Um, it had started at um, a ridiculously no low number, which had me petrified. Because to, to give you some historical data, if we have 79 now, last year we had 92, 
which was a record low. And before that, it had been a six-year average of about 110. And my first year, it was 130. And, you know, and one of the stories I hear that I think is uh, about ministry in general is I want to be a minister and I want to be a, a minister where I can make change. And, and I don't think our congregations are the places to do that. And, and so I think we see more ministers opting to figure out some sort of community ministry they can be doing in, 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 in wherever they live or wherever they want to do, as opposed to looking at, at congregational life as the place to do that. I think that's really, really important point. Um, and it kind of, when you were talking about developmental ministry and you were talking about, you know, congregations having specific needs for developmental ministry, um, particularly around, you know, ministerial conduct, misconduct and, and you know, some of them governance. Um, I wonder if congregations don't think about congregational misconduct and what developmental ministry might look like around that. Um, because I think, you know, particularly, you know, from a religious professional of color standpoint, um, we look at congregations, you know, when we're going into search, to see which one will harm us least, right? And that's part of the equation, you know, not just where best we can serve Unitarian Universalism with our gifts and talents and calling. Um, but the question isn't even, even isn't where, where is it safe? Because we know that we don't have safe spaces, but, um, and if congregations aren't doing that work of self-examination, um, then, then I think you're right. I think more, more folks are going to make decisions that don't take them into the parish ministry. I, I, I completely agree. I mean, it's like, I want to do, people go into ministry because they want to do work that actually means something. I mean, th this is a part of their call, whatever their ministry is, they want to have, uh, the ability to make a difference. And, uh, you know, when you're going into a place that feels hostile where there aren't uh, where they haven't done the work, where there aren't the right covenants, where, um, uh, where, where clearly, uh, you know, they're not willing to rein in the one member who always does something or set appropriate boundaries with someone, people are going to opt to look at, at places that feel more productive and safer to go to. I think, I think that's, I, I think, I, I think, I think, Christina, that's not only the question for Unitarian Universalism, but for religion in general. I think this is, uh, a question that so many uh, congregations, regardless of their faith background, are dealing with. I mean, that 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 sort of uh, white traditional model of what church uh, was I, no longer functions particularly well. And you're, we're watching people across the denominations um, uh, really wrestle with this. And and I think in most places, I mean, we are lucky. I was just at an interfaith meeting with people who do what I do and who credential ministers, uh, we are the only liberal denomination that isn't losing members and churches at hemorrhaging kinds of rates. I was talking with a friend of mine um, who in the UCC ministry area and, and they're expecting in 30 years, they're currently at 5,000 congregations, they're expecting in 30 years, they'll be down to 1,000 UCC congregations. And, 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 and we pretty much have, have have flatlined over the last any number of years without seeing specific growth or uh, specific decline, but but we're on the precipice too. If we don't if we don't step into uh, gear and, and move forward and think about church being different, uh, I think we'll see us in decline too. Well, yeah, I mean you're talking about a what was it a 25 percent decrease in in folks in search. I mean that's over you know from if you started. At, and I'm not sure exactly when you said you started, it was at 130 and we're just at about 80 this past year. That's a precipitous decline. Yeah, that, that was that, that, that figure, the first figure of 130 was 2011. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you know, I, I now realize I'm now a long timer in the transitions office, so it still feels relatively short. But I mean, it um, uh, watch it. Watching these numbers are are, are concerning to me. I mean, is the decline? I'm curious because you look at the numbers. Is the decline 
largely in new ministers or in ministers who are leaving where they are or or both equally i you know that's a good question um one of the things that we're hopeful for the new settlement system is that is that i will actually be able to push buttons and get actual data as opposed to having to do everything by hand which is what i did for eight years and just sort of like let me go back and see what age this person is and 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 and, and all of that in general, the bigger decline that I've seen, though, is in experienced ministers. I mean, gone is the model that the senior minister picks up and takes their family uh, wherever they want to go to next. This is usually a negotiation. Um, in most um, ministry families, um, the, the, the minister is either a co-equal breadwinner or the second income, in, which really affects mobility. It really affects people's um, opportunity to move, you know, and, and we just simply with 1100 congregations roughly in the US and Canada do not have the geography working in our favor. You know, if, you know, unless you're in, in the major metropolitan areas with multiple congregations, if you're in Charlottesville, for example, where Christina is, you know, you have to go 75 miles to your next UU congregation. I mean, uh, I was in a training a few years ago, and there are many Lutheran congregations in southeastern Pennsylvania, as there are UU congregations across the United States and Canada. And, and, and that really affects geography and mobility and what people can do. And I think it affects who even thinks about going into the ministry, because it's like, am I going to go in? Am I going to go have one ministry? I mean, I think about places that are even more isolated, you know, when you're talking earlier. Um, about um, other things, Anchorage, Alaska is in, in search for next year. Um, there is one other congregation in Alaska that has a minister. Um, so if you're thinking about going to Anchorage, unless you have some mobility, you know, how does that affect your, your potential to look at this particular congregation? Um, so th that's the reality. Yeah, I will say that the uh, ministerial intern from our cluster was the one who went to Alaska. Uh, I guess it was two years ago, <laughs> and we still miss her. <laughs> to, Fair, mm -hmm. to Fairbanks? Is she, is she way up there? I? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Fairbanks. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. I, I think this is just a very interesting thing. You know, when you talk about governance, for instance, I hate governance. I loathe it. There are people who are not ministers who are way better at governance than I am. And as Keith knows, I'm part of a creative team right now doing an interim, three of us sharing it. And I really wonder about broadening out our thought of what it means to be a minister, um, because I think kind of the here's the, the one who can do all of it, you know, um, it really ends up with a lot of us doing what we don't like a whole lot of the time. And, and so I really wonder, I mean, I, maybe everyone wants to do the same thing. I don't know, but like, thank God Arif Mamdani loves governance and is excellent at it. So he's on our team and doing that, but he, he was excellent at it before he went to seminary. You know, he, he brought that right. into seminary. And I just wonder about, I know New Jersey, there's a team with an administrator, I think, and a religious educator and a minister. And I just wonder if if some more collaborative way of thinking about search um, is possible, where it's not like the minister comes in and then the rest of the staff has to work with that minister and maybe it'll work and maybe it won't. And I, I don't know, do you see other creative models besides like New Jersey and you know this little tiny thing we're doing? I mean, I'm just curious if other people are starting to break out of the box of minister a little bit more? I, my worry is that it's happening, but happening way too slowly. I mean, I think we have to become creative, that we have to think differently about this. Um, often when a, a senior minister calls me up and say, I want to look for a second minister, my first question is, do you really want a, a really good executive director and functioning team instead? What is it you want for this position? Um, and, and, and what's the kind of work that needs to be done? Because I, I, I think, I, I, you know, I think these creative models actually are the future, that, um, th that we, we, we are going to ha have to be thinking uh, 
creatively and more collaboratively about the work done and what work needs to be done and be very clear about what work, it, what is the work of the church and who needs to do it. I mean, ultimately in most congregations, good ministry is defined by um, four things. Um, and good ministry is first defined by someone who does no harm, which is way more complicated than you think. Uh, someone who builds trust uh, with a congregation and maintains the trust. Someone who does good preaching and good pastoral care. To me, those are sort of the basic four fundamentals uh, for what a congregation expects, whether explicitly or implicitly from the ministry. Beyond that, what you get is, is really a bonus. Um, and, 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 you know, I really worry about um, um, uh, the congregations that, that aren't able to, to, to see that or say that or the ministers who don't see some of those things as important. Uh, I, I, I really think that I'd love to see this be uh, a continental conversation about, you know, what is it exactly we need in a minister and ministry in this particular time and age? I, you know, your little example, Meg, of what's going on in Minnesota with you and Arif and Terry, I share that example almost everywhere I go, just to try and encourage some creative thinking. I talk about Summit, New Jersey and what um, um, Tule and Emily and Robin are doing together. I, I, I just think these, if we don't start thinking differently, it, it's just a way of, 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 of suffocating ourselves and, and you know, discouraging whatever uh, potential passion people bring to their church uh, from becoming alive. Yeah, and I think we need to do that in our ministerial formation, right? It can't just be in the congregations. It needs to be part of the ministerial formation process so that it's, it's the both and. It's, it's both sides exerting pressure into the change. Um, so Kathy Siegel just has um, a Harvard Divinity class that she teaches around religious education, and she had uh, Thule, myself, um, Eric Wickstrom, Leah Derwin Jones, Asia was um, was going to be on, but was, wasn't able to join us. But talking to that class about um, about shared ministry and shared leadership, and and I think it's going on in more places than we probably know, and we need to lift those up and then make it a part of, you know, that ministerial formation. So, you know, my challenge to Star King is, you know, where's the class, where, where does this concept fit in at Star King? Where does this concept fit in, you know, at Meadville? Where does this concept fit in at all the divinity schools that we're drawing through our ministerial formation process? Um, Cause it has to be, it has to be both. That's interesting. Well, it, Go ahead, Keith. Well, I, I was just gonna say, and, 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 and I also think, because I, I think you're exactly right, Christina, and I think we need to do more education with congregational leaders. I mean, I, you know, I, I think in particular, any number of those folks can get trapped into doing this is what's easiest in their minds, even though it actually is making things harder. And I think we need to be educating ministers, um, all staff and congregational leaders about possibilities, because in, in some places we'll see congregations become um, more more creative than they have been. And I think that'll be a huge boon. I mean, you know, I, I really credit the work that, uh, you know, I've seen happen in these congregations is helping these congregations uh, reassemble and come more alive than they have been. Keith, I just wanna say how grateful I am for your description of like the four sort of top things of what a minister needs to do, like, or what they should be thinking about, because I think so many folks um, coming out of seminary feel that pressure that they need to go into a congregation and fix things and <coughs> take control. And like, there's a little bit of, um, oh, what would the word be, you know, animosity there between like ministers and congregations because of that, like, fear on the congregation's part that the minister is going to come in and tell them they're bad and wrong. And, you know, I just feel like let's all take a breath. <laughs> Nobody needs to know everything. Like no one's going to know everything. And we're all learning and we all have to work together 
and so yeah i mean i don't know the idea of shared ministry is so appealing to me and just my personality um but i just want to free everybody up from that you know white supremacist idea of anybody being the expert and having all the answers well i am bingo <laughs> You know, I think to your point, Jess, if I pretend that I know everything, then when I fail doing the things that I really don't know how to do well, um, everything is going to blow up because people are going to be like, well, you said you were an expert at that. Um, so it's to my benefit as a minister to be honest about what I'm good at and what I'm not good at. I mean, that's just, we, we need to sort of get over and I was going to name that what Christina described, I believe, was a religious education class, right? Where that, and I feel like religious educators are often lifting up this need for shared leadership. And it is often the ministers who really are unwilling to understand that we're all stronger when we're all stronger. And yes. um, it is, it is a cultural reality, I think, that, uh, uh, I think Asia referenced earlier, like, uh, you know, having a toy, having your associate be your toy. Well, the staffs of congregations ideally are interconnected. And I'm not saying that there aren't problematic staff sometimes who somebody in some relationship needs to move along, but, but to start with that premise that if there isn't control does feel like this very um, murderous white supremacist idea that, that doesn't help anybody. So we, Asian D, we need your book. We need it soon. We need it. We're working yeah. on it. <laughs> uh, the interesting thing is when I hear people say to me, ministers, well, what would collaborative leadership look like? And I want to say, okay. you really can't infer. You have a degree from seminary. You really can't maybe imagine what those two words might mean. I don't say that. I think it, well, maybe I do say it with my eyes. Yeah, Aisha, you say a lot with your eyes. Let me yeah. tell you. <laughs> it gets me in so much trouble. And does so much good. Let me tell you. It just sort of like sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. And, and sometimes you're at least 20,000 words. So. <laughs> well, Keith, we're coming to the top of the hour. Anything we haven't asked you that you wanted to say? Um, you know, I, I really appreciate the opportunity just to talk about ministry in our congregation in, in general and to talk about who who does it um, um i'm I, i'm just very aware um at at how change is affecting who we are and i hope these are conversations that we can continue to have because um you know next year the first year minister seminar happens uh, here at the UUA and all these folks who are brand new to ministry, who, are, who could well be one of the pieces of the future of Unitarian Universalism. And, um, you know, and, and how do we allow for their creativity, their vision, their ideas to become a, a part and affect us? How do we move forward? You know, um, how, how do we get a better understanding of what, what ministry is needed in this particular time? Um, and, you know, as, you know, we are, and I promise not to get too much on my soapbox. We are living in a time of political crazy. And what does that mean for our congregations and how does it affect the people in our congregations? When, when yes is no and, and upside down is right side up and right side up is upside down. Um, I, I, I just think ministry in some ways is more vital from ever and we should be doing it to each other and and we should be equipping and supporting our ministers and, and other staff to do it well thanks so much and thanks for all your work and it'll be fun to watch the the rest of the story unfold and you're probably right we should have waited a few weeks <laughs> you, you could say more than you can say now but it's good to get the uh the immediate response so thank you next week we'll have a panel of you you muslims speaking very excited about that so uh join us and any any other last words from anyone all right. Good luck at that conference there, Asian Christina. <laughs> really? <laughs> Take care.